Hello, hello. Welcome to PactoCast, our podcast focus on human performance and how these top people perform and train their minds and, and, and all that. Today, I'm very happy to have two old friends here, Susan and Guthrie. We, we chatted and worked together when I was at Adobe and Adobe XD was not even a thing yet. And now we're here. So guys, can you uh, please introduce your, uh, yourselves for us? All right. It's good to see you. Guthrie, who's yes. going first? Uh, it's, I was just going to say, it's fantastic, um, that we can, we can catch up. It's, it's been a little bit, uh, but luckily not too long. So I'm really glad that, um, we're able to attend. How about you, uh, Susan, you can, you can go first. All right. I'm Susan, Susan Weinschenk and, uh, chief behavioral scientist and CEO at our small company we have called the team W and, uh, I have a PhD in psychology and have always been fascinated with, people and brain science and how we think and what motivates us. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to talk about uh, the science uh, around what, what you do, Damien. So that's me, Guthrie. Sure. So my name's Guthrie. Um, I, my, my background's a little different. Um, she does a lot of the behavioral psychology. Uh, my education is in, I have an economics degree, and then I also went to law school. So I do a little bit of everything, um, you know, <laughs> answer a lot of emails and stuff and do, you know, corporate taxes. But uh, I, I, I talk about ethics, which is sort of that intersection, especially with design and technology and also behavioral economics is generally my, my, my uh, parts about expertise. So I, I wrote a book that's too long that summarizes all the behavioral <laughs> economics research. No, really that's big, amazing. Really big. It's not. I mean, it's not that. That's that's like. Okay. That's like the Lord it's of the Rings. That big. Wow, that's 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 amazing. Thank you so much, guys. Super happy to learn about like the the, the scientific side of things, right? Because as you probably heard, we have uh, top athletes interviewed, business leaders interviewed, and it's nice to see a, a more rational, more scientific uh, approach to to this challenge. And everyone that we interviewed so far really shares that the mind is is the biggest challenge right it's the biggest thing to 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 manage the hardest thing to manage right it can really put you like in very tough scenarios and uh only add things that are negative so the i would like to start this this conversation by asking how you see the mind in this like challenging life life defining moment um uh, how does that matter wow uh guthrie you're almost smiling what is that because it's a tough question or because you no, know I was that only at the reaction on on your face when... oh well you know uh, um so i have kind of like the the objective science point of view and then i have my personal experience point of view uh, and i can talk about both of those if you want but yeah, please please you know i um because i recently in the last Oh, what year and a half uh, went through a whole thing with cancer oh, and wow. uh, have survived it and come out of the other side of it. And I so mean, that was a, you know, just uh, uh, an, an amazing, not necessarily fun experience. And when I first started on that journey, I had someone, I had, a friend I had called who had also had cancer and uh, struggled with it throughout a lot of her lifetime. And she said something to me that was so interesting. She said, you know, um, uh, this is going to be a very tough experience, um, it, but it doesn't have, to, doesn't have to be a miserable experience. And I, when she said that, I was like, oh, okay, I'm not sure I know what that means. You know, now I know what she means. But I have to say, it's so interesting. All the things I know about science and how the brain works, and and you know, I practice mindfulness meditation to be in the present moment, and um, uh, everything I know about uh, how our point of view and the stories we tell ourselves affects our behavior. I know all that, and yet when I was faced <laughs> with dealing with it, I was terrible. Uh, you know, it's like, I would, it's like, I know I'm making myself miserable by being anxious about this, but when you're in the middle of it, you know, really being able to, to 
um, cut it off, cut off the anxiety, cut off the tension, cut off the obsessions. Um, it can be, it can really be a struggle. And it's kind of interesting. And I think anyone, whether you're going through an illness or a, a trauma, or if you're an athlete, I can imagine, um, I'm not an athlete, but I'm imagining that a lot of times you are kind of watching yourself, like you can almost see yourself and how you're reacting. So, you know, the, what I have learned um, personally through this is that uh, there's a, a lot that goes on that's unconscious that you don't have control over. Um, and I think a lot of times the best thing you can do is accept you what's going on and accept your own reaction to it and try to have some patience. I also think that the training you've done up to that point when you need the resources, right? The training does help. So I can only imagine if I hadn't had training, you know, in, if I didn't know about how the mind works, if I didn't know, if I hadn't had training in mindfulness, um, it, it, I'm assuming it would be even even worse. But uh, and Guthrie was with me a couple of times. What I remember one time just sitting there going, "Okay, I should know how to deal with this. You know, I know how the mind works. I know how how to change the habits of my mind and my body. Uh, I need to use this um, to to move forward. But it can be it can be very challenging. But certainly, you know, one of the things I think is the most interesting in this field is that um, there, the science tells us that uh, the, the, there's two different places in the brain that react, for instance, to pain. And one part of that uh, is very um, uh, objective. It's like, oh, pain signal, pain signals, signal, something's going on in your hand. Uh, and it's evaluating whether it is uh, just a little bit of pain, don't worry about it or whether it's a lot of pain and you need to do something about it. And all this is happening unconsciously until the, the, that pain center says, it's a real problem, do something, and then it'll go into the conscious part of the brain. But that's separate from another part of the brain that is making judgments. So I think that's the interesting thing. You know, you can, you can have uh, pain, you can have struggle, you can be tired, you know, all the things that might be making it hard for you to deal with what's going on. But if you can get that separation, if you can uh, learn to pause between the experience and your reaction to the experience, that's, I think, where the magic um, of the, the brain, you know, this intersection between what's really going on and what, how you should react to it. But then if you add the extra variable, you're in danger, like it's happening to you, then it becomes more, even more challenging, right? Because you have all the tools, you know what to do, but then your probably like an old brain, like I was like, things from the, the old days is probably like you're under threat. So you need to do something, move, or you're going to be eaten by this lion or something. Yes. And that's yes. The, the, the challenging part. Yeah. And overcoming, you know, we all have habitual reactions, you know, to, to what's going on. And sometimes those are really useful, right? Um, they protect you from the lion or the snake or whatever, the fire. But then sometimes they're not useful and yeah. you're going into these old patterns. And so, uh, you know, what we know about the science of habits and of conditioned responses um, can can be really useful. That's amazing. Um, yeah, one thing that I that I that I'm hearing from these like top athletes so far is that when they're competing and something goes wrong, they they've been there so much, they train so much that instead of being like afraid of oh I'm getting distant from my goal because this went wrong, they uh, hyper focus on that little thing that went wrong to fix that at that time. So they really go into like, I need to fix this. I need to just stay focused instead of uh, panicking. Right. And, and right. And starting that unconscious loop. 
because your goal is kind of moving away from you, <laughs> you know, that's challenge. Guthrie, uh, any, any thoughts on that? I mean, there, we, we covered a lot of ground. How about, how about we, we sort of narrow in on, on one part? Yeah. Yeah, totally. To... Um, you guys, you guys really, um, inspired me when I started like reading and listening to you about this idea of, uh, that it's shared across pr pretty much all humans, this mm -hmm. uh, desire for mastery, right? And you talk about that a lot. Um, and all these like successful athletes, business leaders, they, they share that I have goals pretty well defined. Any, any tools, like how to train your mind or how to set goals, how to like make sure you can see things to get to better results instead of just thinking, oh, this is too far, uh, uh, probably not doable. Yeah, uh, Guthrie, do you want to go first, or do you want me to go? Well, uh, just just as a as a quick summary, you know, the desire for mastery. I, I wonder. I do wonder if it's sort of on a spectrum, you know, where some people, much like uh, there, there's a lot of these these different things where it's sort of like one way or another. So you can have people who are really risk averse, and really you know not so risk averse, and it's a spectrum, right? So uh, as I like to say, some people are like, hey, I'm going to go out of the cave and run over the field and maybe I'll get eaten by a tiger and maybe I'll find something cool. And But whatever, I like to take a lot of risks. Some people are like, I'm fine in the cave. Just keep me in the cave. I'll hang out. It's fine. And I think in the same way, uh, there's, there's a spectrum of desire for mastery. Some people, like, they have this drive. I have to be getting better. I have to be getting better. Like if I'm not improving and getting better and growing and moving and upgrading and like it eats at them. And I think so, you know, and it's a spectrum and some people uh, are lower on the spectrum and some people are higher. I would guess that when it comes to elite athletes, a lot of them are probably on the extreme end of the spectrum. Like they just, it's just this like bug, you know. Like and the, all, des the desire for mastery is really, really strong for them. And you, we've heard stories of, you know, the, you know, Kobe's or MJ's or, you know, pick, pick your sport where the person's like, oh yeah, I train like 12 hours a day and I can't stop and I have to win and I have to be better and I have to maximize my potential. And I just, you know, I'm drinking kale juice left and right and anything I can possibly do, you know, I just got to go, go, go. Um, so I do think it mad. It, I, so, so while every, while there are some brain structures, I think that are, innate to biologically um, for almost all humans, there is certainly a spectrum on how people experience that and how it manifests. Um, so with, with that said, the desire for mastery, I think, is one of the uh, more overlooked motivators. It's really, really strong. Um, people usually think rewards is a strong motivator, and it's usually not, and not nearly as strong as people think. Um, but the desire for mastery is a probably not as strong as social cues for most people, but it's it's up there. It's a it's a very very strong motivator. People will put in a ton of time and effort if they feel that again desire to improve. What, why is that? Like scientifically, like because let's say I'm an athlete, yes, a trophy becomes like metal, right? It's just a thing sitting somewhere. But what is this thing that? probably acts as a reward where you're the first one doing this thing. Uh, for example, Michi was the first person on earth that did the 1260 on a huge ramp. Uh, but what is it that keeps people going there? Like what's, what, what happens in the brain when you achieve that? Because he said, it's like amazing. It's a big moment, but then it's over and you're going to move to the next thing. Like what happens in the brain when you get to your goals? Yeah, you know, there's there's so there's a lot that happens. So um, it it definitely is uh, going to be like a reward. So it's really interesting. I mean, rewards are really powerful in the brain, but the giving an external reward to someone is actually not what makes it powerful. It's the internal reward and the internal effect uh, and the internal motivation that is really what drives it. So um, there's a couple of things going on. One is that uh, we know that I, I think people who 
are really are at that extreme end of desire for mastery. I think for a variety of reasons, they've really finally honed the three aspects that that encourage this drive drive for mastery, which are autonomy. So they, you know, in order to have a desire for mastery, you have to feel like you have some control over the whole thing. If you feel like you don't have any control, you're not, it's not going to grow. That desire for mastery not, is not going to get to be a huge part of your life. So you have to feel like you have some control over what you're doing and how you're doing it. You have to feel that um, you are getting feedback about how it's going. Now, by feedback, I don't mean that someone from the outside is telling me necessarily, oh, you're doing a good job or anything like that. Uh, just the doing of it, you know, and especially with athletes, right? I mean, if you're trying to get better at a particular uh, technique or or throwing free throws, I mean, you can you get feedback. You throw the ball. Did it make it in or not? That is the feedback. So, feedback built into what you're doing, um, and making sure you have lots of feedback so you can do that constant auto correcting, and and then the third part of it is you have to have the right amount of challenge. And I think also, you know, people who are masters at this um, are very good at getting very honed in on that, right? If it's too hard, you'll give up. If it's too easy, you get bored. And you want to stay right on the edge of that. And uh, so really getting good, you know, really getting skillful at finding that edge for you at each moment, because that edge is going to change, right? If you're an athlete, that's going to change day to day. And, yeah. um, you know, those are the things that are going to keep propelling you forward. And so it, so actually you're getting constant rewards if you're working on it, right? Because every time you get that feedback, every time you kind of notch up to the next level of challenge, that acts as a reward and, and that's going to release certain brain chemicals that are then going to keep you going to the next step and so on. But really getting the, that right amount of those three, I, I think is, is critical. And, and there's another piece too, Damien. I think it's not just the desire for mastery. There's a lot that goes on in the brain with the whole idea of creativity. Because you mentioned before about you know, people who set goals. And I actually think that taps into what we know about creativity. So creative problem solving or, or, or creating something new. Um, what we know about the creative networks in our brain is there are three creative networks. There's the executive attention network, the imagination network, and the salience network. I didn't name them. <laughs> Those are just what they're called. And so if you want to reach a goal, the best thing you can do is work with these brain networks, which means the, the first step, you you need to set your intention. That you do consciously. And I think people who reach their goals, whether in uh, you know athletic or business or whatever, I think they're particularly good. They've just learned to set their goal clearly and make it a you know a concrete, reachable goal. And then what you have to do is you have to let your what's called the imagination network go to work. That's unconscious. And what the imagination network does is it it runs simulations. Oh, uh, wow. oh I which you know she wants to get this goal. Well, we could do that. We could do that. We could do that. It takes everything <laughs> you know and everything you've learned, and it starts running simulations. In order for that to work you have to let go of the conscious attention. And so people who are really good at this have learned, I'm going to set the, set the intention and then I'm going to forget about it and I'm going to go do other things. And we've all had, I'm sure you've had too, Damien, that, that aha moment where, you know, you're playing with your kids or you're planting something in the garden or you go for a run and you just get this idea and you go, oh, maybe I should do such and such. That's your imagination network at work. And what it does is it brings, it picks out the best ideas and sends them to the salience network, which then pops it into your consciousness. 
And the people, I think, who are really successful at reaching their goals, whether they have they knew about this or not, they've learned to work with those three networks and they, they set the intention, they let go and forget about it, trusting that they're going to get an idea. And then the other piece, I think, that distinguishes accomplished people from just big thinkers is they act on the idea, right? Because you're going to get these ideas. If you don't do anything with them, it's not going to get you anywhere. And oh. I, so I think people who are successful at reaching their goals, it's because whether the desire for mastery or whether the creative, the way the brain works creatively, they've either learned about it or they've just stumbled upon it and they're doing, you know, they're really working well with their brains and maybe not even realizing that they are, but, but they are. That's amazing. Yeah, no, know that I, I, I had no idea. Um, it's, it's interesting because sometimes you think that overdoing things is the best route because you're the, but then it gets you tired and it, it, it's not giving the, the, that, that opportunity for a brain to, to imagine what to do, right. And be creative and run, and run all the tests. Yeah. Uh, was it alarm somewhere? No, I think Guthrie, I think we hear your heat. Oh, it's it's likely I have I have radiator heat. He's not in <laughs> California. He's in Chicago. He I'm in an heat. old, you know, hundred year old brick building in Chicago with uh, with radiator heat. So yes, and it just went on. Awesome. Yeah, it did stop now. Um, yeah. So w what what can we do as 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 like trying to be at the best level we can, what can we do to to let that happen? Should we sleep better? Should we eat better? Should we do exercises and really go somewhere? Like for, for how much time? Is there like a, a science on the amount of like, I'll, I'll let my, my, my unconscious brain figure this out and then do something else. Is there data there that we can kind of calibrate? For our There's actions. not a, any particular amount of time, unfortunately. I think it, I think we should also separate the mental components from the physical components because these yes. are two different. You know, yes, the, yes. the physiology of the two are are different, and the brain. Well, people don't think about it, but the brain it's not a muscle, but it is it, it's something that gets tired. There is glucose that needs to be replenished. Like there, there it's not it's not just like this ethereal calculator. There, there are, there are, uh, it needs rest too, and probably even more so than muscles and oh, wow. stuff like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and you, you know, the research shows that this, this whole creativity thing that I was talking about, um, sleep is really important to that. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you don't get enough sleep, if, as Guthrie said, if you're, if you're mentally tired, um, if you're physically tired, then it's all that work that your brain wants to do is it's going to have a hard time doing. Um, there isn't any particular amount of time that you should let those intentions go. Unfortunately, it really varies a lot based on how, um, you know, if you have more knowledge, if you're, if the problem that you're trying to solve or the idea that you've put in as an intention is one that you have a lot of knowledge around, then it'll happen faster because your brain will have more to run simulations on, right? Um, so that would make it faster. So, you know, just being an expert in something helps. But, um, and then if you're not overly tired, if you're not overly using your brain, that will make it go faster. But it's really uh, individual to the particular intention you have set as to how long you need to to let that that's, unconscious part go. That's amazing. Yeah. And I, and I think for the physical part that Guthrie was referring to, the more repetitions, the more like data you're registering, like which muscles, like little muscles have to act at that certain time. So you don't have to think about those things. I surf better when I train a lot, when I repeat a lot. 
uh, just because of that uh, knowledge. But when I'm competing, it's funny because the more I think of it, the worse I do. So I have to be more relaxed and let that all those data that 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 got registered over time act without my my thinking, my 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 like conscious thinking, and it's super interesting. Do you do you see like um, any 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 insights on this? I I, I had a, a, an experience that I shared in another episode where I was I was a a, a racer, a go kart racer when I was younger, and I remember I was like running professionally it was it was my life for more than 10 years when i was young back in brazil mm -hmm. and i remember one race that it was probably the best race i've ever had at the very last turn i was able to go over this guy and, and, and win that race but that whole thing happened without me thinking like i was so into it that it really felt that me and the cart like we were one thing and i remember like just flashes of like my my footwork and all that like it was it was not like i was not thinking about it it was just happening and when i mentioned this to uh some athletes and and they were like yeah sometimes you get to your a game and it's very rare but sometimes you get to your a game uh what, what do you think about like that perfect presentation that perfect contest that perfect run uh when you're not really thinking about it, you're like super relaxed. Yeah. And... Yeah. I mean, there, there's a couple things going on there. One is I, it sounds like it was partially perhaps due to what's called being in a flow state. So um, there's research about when you are totally immersed in what you are doing, you, um, you kind of gate out everything around you, except the one thing that you're doing. And you go into a hyper-focused uh, mindset with your brain and your body. And um, when you're in that place, uh, you um, uh, time time gets strange. Like yeah. you don't, you're not aware really of time passing. It's also uh, it's a usually most people say it's it's feels good to be in that place like it's, it's a nice zone to be in and um you know part of one of the things also that that has to do with being in a flow state but also has to do with i think what you were talking about is muscle memory which maybe your athletes have talked about um when you've talked to them you know when you when you really have practiced a uh, something physical, whether large motor physical or small motor physical, when you've practiced it over and over and over, so it, it can, it, it'll run by, by itself and you don't have to think about it. And in fact, thinking about it, as you said, could, could totally mess it up. I remember um, one time uh, as an example, um, my daughter played piano uh, when she was young and did the whole Suzuki piano thing. And and she was, you know, uh, she was not a concert pianist, but she was pretty good at what she was doing. And she played, um, you know, she was at a concert and she played her sonata, right? It was all memorized. And and at one point I said, what are you thinking about during, when you're giving a performance, right? You're in the concert hall and you're giving it. And she's like, you know, 10 years old. And she just <laughs> gave this performance, you know? I said, what are you thinking about? And she looked at me and she said, thinking? <laughs> I said, yeah, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about, oh, yeah, this is what the section that comes next or this is where I get louder? And she just looked really confused and she said, I'm just watching my hands. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, you're what? Yeah. She said, I'm just watching my hands. And I was like, oh. oh so she God. wasn't thinking, right? She had practiced yeah. so much. That she just sat down and then her fingers did it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, any any tools that we can use to better get to like a flow state to perform better? Or I at think, least like be there better? Yeah, right. I think I think you can practice it. I think you can um, purposefully, you know, try to gate stuff out. Uh, I heard a podcast recently with Alex Caruso, who's an NBA basketball player and is specifically good in defense. And so they asked him, okay, so how are you so good at defense? Like, what are you thinking about? And he says, 
I tr- I try so hard not to think. It's just read and react. Like I'm not. I am. I've done so much practice. I've I've just uh, done rep after rep after rep after rep of okay. Player does this. I do this. Player does this. I do this. Player does this. I do this. So that when you're in the game, you just let it happen and you trust your instincts. And and it and he says that's the only way I can like get good results. Once I start thinking, I'm too slow. I heard everybody say this about everything. People who give talks, and I've and I've experienced it in the realms that I work. Uh, if you're giving a speech, I there's a my I have a vocal coach for singing, and she says exactly the same thing. You know, you practice and you practice and you practice all this technique and that technique, but then when you get up there to perform, don't you know? The reason you're doing all that practice is so that it will happen automatically when you need it to. Yeah, you absolutely. Will, you will default to have you uh, mastered. Like it's it's really yeah. yeah yeah. And I think you do. I think in the flow state. Yes, I agree with Guthrie. You you can practice and you need to practice the flow state. Meaning, and in, in this this I think it's it's hard for us sometimes to do this. We live in a in a world where we are being in, we are encouraged to fragment our attention, you know, to to be in conversation, but also checking our text so messages, That's you know, so bad, to yeah. be with our children, but also, uh, you know, doing something else. And um, so, what you need, and it's not that that that's just modern technology. I remember having an argument, I guess you could say, with someone not too long ago. He said, well, you know, back before technology, you know, if you lived in the in the 1500s, you know, in a tribal community, you didn't have all this uh, uh, multitasking. I'm like, are you kidding? <laughs> I got to I got to look for food and make sure I don't get eaten by the tiger. You know, (laughs) of course you are multitasking. So I don't think it's just modern day, but I do think if you want to be in that, in that flow state, you have to practice it. You have to say for the next 10 minutes, half hour, one hour, whatever it is, I'm going to, I'm going to gate everything else out. I'm going to, turn off my notifications. I'm going to put myself in a quiet room just with the tools, or maybe it's, you know, I'm going to go running or whatever it is, but I'm just going to do that. And, and I'm going to be uh, present in the moment with this one task. Uh, And you, you have to practice that. I think you have to practice being in the flow state and then it will come more easily. Or yeah, just uh, relaxed, doing doing the train and relax and train and relax and and I think um, it is it's more common for people to be loose. I think in sports where they have events and uh, like people who have less events, I think they get sometimes can get you know really tight. Um, whereas like baseball players, you know. They're playing 162 games. Wow. They're pretty used to it. Maybe. You're training, yeah, but, you're training your brain. But the, the, the challenging part is that it looks like our brains, they really want us like to get the short rewards. Like they don't the, the brain doesn't want to like at least if we're running, if we're doing something hyper focused, if I'm playing with my kids and all that, it's always like maybe if I go to my phone right now, I can get that like or that answer or that news that i was looking for i i I have a routine that's probably horrible i go to news website i go to like social media sites and all that but it's easy to go there it's right there it's it it gives you that short reward short-term reward but then at the same time it's damaging all the the big goals that is there anything that we can do to kind of trick our, our brains to not go there? Yeah, uh, it's what you've done. See, our brains are very good at learning uh, what's called a conditioned response. They're just wonderful loop. at it. You have yeah, dopamine loop. You have a stimulus and you respond. Um, and and we're and so you know these these devices really 
tie into that. And, and the things that make that happen are when there is in an audio or visual cue, right? When you hear ding, you know, on your phone and something happened, or when you get a little visual notification, that is what, that helps cause a conditioned response. Uh, and also unpredictability helps a conditioned response. So that, you know, cause you don't know when you're gonna get a text, right? Um, you don't know when the next, you know, Twitter message is going to come. And so it's unpredictable. It has an audio or visual cue. And also, interestingly, it involves a small muscle movement. You know, the fact that you, uh, you scroll with your finger. That, so those three things feed into conditioned responses. So you have to just unlearn it. That, you know, you have, <laughs> but that, but you, what you have to do is you have to, turn the phone off and put it literally out of sight. You have to turn the computer off. You know, you, you can unlearn it, but you have to, you have to unlearn it because all those conditioned responses are now set up. You set it up. You <laughs> learned it beautifully. Yeah. And now you gotta go learn something else instead. Yeah. So if you're trying to quit smoking or quit drinking, don't hang out with a bunch of smokers and drinkers and do the same habits you were doing when you were smoking or drinking that's yeah. that's you know you're it's not gonna not a good and way to the, have success and it's the same with our attention you just need to retrain your attention it is possible that's, to do that's amazing yeah I, I need to do a lot more of that uh it's yeah we work so hard and uh, long days of work now i have a startup that takes my nights and weekends as well and it's just hard like you want that dopamine you know like hitting your brain all the time and um just as like a small pleasure right and it's it, it's hard to but you give can up on re that. no but you don't have to give up on that you can retrain to get the dopamine from something else yes see yes. that's the thing you can just say okay i'm not going to get the dopamine for i'm going to retrain so the dopamine isn't coming from scrolling on tiktok right <laughs> i don't so have that TikTok, yeah, yet <laughs> <laughs> don't don't go there, Dane. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. I was like uh, speaking with some teenagers and everything here because my daughter is growing and growing up, and they don't even use Instagram anymore. They're all on, on Snapchat, so it's like this almost like super hard to use platform, right? That it's so hard for parents to to get used to. So they, it's just growing. But yeah, let, let's not go off on a tangent on that. Uh, you talked about training your brain like and there's this idea of mental conditioning and there are tools that we can use there like uh self-talk anxiety management um breathing what tools can you use like at least for you like what do you think are the best ones to 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 really train our brain as a muscle not being a muscle but as a muscle to to get better and, and know how to do uh the best things possible yeah, I mean, there's a lot, right? So we were just talking about um, the fact that whatever you do a lot of, you will then start to do automatically. So if you want to do a lot of something else, then start doing the something else. But I also think, you know, for me, and, and I think which technique works best in which situation and for which person, that does vary. You know, Guthrie mm -hmm. mentioned about this, this spectrum of how much will um, the desire for mastery, you know, motivate some people. But one of the things that, that I think often, well, the research shows it is, it is the most powerful way to make a long-term behavior change, a behavior, a big behavior change that will stick over the long term. And that is the idea of self stories. So we all have stories that we tell ourselves and other people some of these we tell ourselves consciously, some are unconscious about who we are and what's important to us and what we do and why we do the things we do. These self stories are always operating and they really drive our behavior. And the research, and this is, a, there's a wonderful book called Redirect by Timothy Wilson, Dr. Timothy Wilson. And he, he covers the, this research on this it's actually amazingly easy 
to change your self story. Like you would think it would be really hard, right? Because some of these self stories we've had for years, right? And uh, but you can actually change them. And when you change the self story, the behavior just changes right along with it. Like it's just this unconscious shift. So I think, I mean, for me personally, especially when I'm going through difficult times or anxious times, I, I use that. I use that a lot. I'll just um, stop <laughs> and, and I'll write out, I'll literally write out here, here's this, here's a story that is, uh, I can, you're I think your, is operating. You're writing your future press release. Yeah. Well, first I do the current, you know, I just write it all out, you know, the current story. That's usually not a pretty story. That's usually not a happy story, you know, but it's like, let's just be real here. What the heck is going on? And I'll write it out. And that's like the sad <laughs> and depressing story and then i'll say okay okay i'm gonna i'm gonna rewrite it now you don't it's not just about what you hope your future self will be it's a reinterpretation of what's happening right now anything that happens there are different ways you can write that story right different ways you can describe what's happening and so you know, something happens to us or we don't reach a goal. Let's say, Damien, we have a goal and you know what? We didn't reach it. We didn't win that race. We didn't do a good job giving that talk, right? We can describe that as, um, you know, I, I tried, but I'm just never going to be able to do it. And I failed. And, uh, you know, I... I, I do, I'm just not going to be able to perform at this level. You know, it's not in me. I knew what I knew it wasn't going to work. Yeah. Or, or whatever yeah, is that time. negative self-talk, yeah. but then you can rewrite that story. So it can be, you know, uh, I tried to give this talk and it was a stretch and I learned a lot from it. And even though, it wasn't perfect. Uh, now I know what I might do to make it better. Now I can, you know, I'm adding to my, my experience, right? I mean, you can rewrite the same, you can describe the same experience in a way that changes your story. So now instead of I'm a failure, I'll never be able to do it. I'll never get any better. The story is I'm working at this and I'm going to continue to work on it and I'm going to grow and I'm going to get better. That's amazing. Yeah. I, 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 re I really feel we have an opportunity to decide, but then the, the challenge part is humans want to be like part of the tribe, like being accepted, have this status. Like I, I get to a certain level and then when when you have a, a new story in your mind, you know where you want to go. You know what, like how to read that challenging moment. But then if you have signals from from the world saying you're bad, you're not doing it right, and like all these reinforcements, that makes it much harder, right, to to rewrite that story. Um, so uh, how can how can we leave that out of our minds? Like the the negative thoughts, the the the, all the opinions that you're getting from other people uh, that will only make you sink more and fail more. Guthrie, you had mentioned before about yeah. social. Do you want to chime in here? Well, the one thing I will say is that there are some things in our brains that are the same for everyone. I, but I, th I think there's actually a ton of individual differences between people and what might work with one person may not work for anyone. So some people are really get really motivated if someone's yelling at them, you know, sort of the drill sergeant style trainer. And some people that just, it turns them off and they just, they just, they're, they don't take it. So I, I do think there's a little bit of a, you know, you got to know yourself. Um, there is uh, in like the NBA, there's, there's this idea of the irrational confidence guy. It's like, this person is maybe not the best uh, basketball player, 
but he but like truly believes in his mind for better or for worse that they are the best basketball player the world has ever created and they play like it they shoot all the time they do everything but like having that irrational confidence allows them to unlock potential that otherwise they wouldn't have you know if they had any sort of self doubt that would maybe hold them back but bef- but because they they walk around with sort of a, a swagger that they are the best basketball player ever they can sort of, you know, do stuff. So that's that's something that works for some people. I don't know if that necessarily works for everyone. That's um, an amazing one. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, I use it sometimes. It's almost like you don't care too much. You you just do your best. So you make the conscious decision to do your best, and whatever happens, happens. Right. There's always an X race. There's always an X presentation to deliver, uh, and that like I think releases a lot of the pressure that you have, and you do better. So that leads us to like the last, and I would love to hear from both of you, uh, this idea of fulfillment and, and happiness. Like what, what is happiness to both of you guys in terms of like succeeding and, and like what creates that fulfillment in reality? Because oh, you tried so many things, right? That's and you such did a so good, many things. It's such a good question. And I, I remember listening to interviews of people who have like won championships and they have like, you know, they have like the two days where it's really great. And then they just don't feel fulfilled at all. Because and, and then they're right? miserable that they want miserable because their their whole system of brain training is predicated on onto the next, gotta get better. It's a loop, right? It's a dopamine loop. Let's what's the next thing? What's the next thing? What's the next thing? And that's what keeps them hyper motivated to move forward and achieve their goals. So like I I don't think that people who are hyper motivated are ever satisfied. I don't think it's something they can do. Maybe if they step away, you know, maybe that's the only way. If you say, "I've done this," I like 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 uh, like um, some some uh, some musician. Um, I, I remember Yo Yo Ma in an interview saying that there was this time on Letterman when he he played some piece of music and in that moment he played it perfectly. You know, there wasn't a single vibrato out of place. There wasn't a single micro position of a single finger that he could have improved. And you just hit the top of the mountain and then he's sort of like, well, now what do I do? (laughs) You know? Um, So to succeed and then feel fulfillment I, I think I think that's very different and very difficult. Yeah, what, you know, there's a great book called uh, "Stumbling on Happiness." Do you know that one, Damien? No, not yet. By Dan Gilbert, and and it's all about the research on the happiness, and it's wow. just I it's so interesting, so interesting. So, um, yeah, I think that I I, I think that you know achieving your goals i agree with guthrie the research is pretty clear that may not make you happy and so i think there's a certain amount of uh experimentation that we all need to do to kind of discover wait a minute what really what do i really want what really what's really important to me what really makes me feel good and or better uh, than feel good feel satisfied Feel satisfied. Which is a I, sort of slightly different emotion than feeling good. Yes. And and it's I think you have to kind of experiment with that. And it might not be what you thought. Right. Oh, yeah, I mean, oh, how yeah. many, how many wealthy, high achieving people are there in the world who it, you look at them and you go, well, they don't look very happy. I, <laughs> I, I don't want to be living their life, right? Yeah. How many, you know, people... Uh, the celebrities all, who get fame and then complain and then about how terrible fame they is. They can't even go out of the house, right? So I think, I think uh, we have to really stop and think, what does, what does happiness really mean? And, you know, is that even something that that I want. You know, I had a realization recently that that I've known, but I guess I didn't really realize how important it was to me. I really like learning stuff. Like learning something new is like, 
the equivalent of eating chocolate to me. You know, it's like, I enjoy that. And so it's like, well, I think I'm going to rearrange my schedule and my time so I have more time to learn, you know, I and I, I picked music because I like to compose music. And it was like, why don't I actually like embark on studying music? Like I've never officially taken music courses. Why don't I do that? I love music and I like to learn. And so I'm going to carve out time in my life to do that. I think sometimes we have to experiment and and do that. That's amazing. Oh, yeah. Maybe, maybe a last, last one. I promise this is the last one. <laughs> uh, there is a lot of people, including myself, that find fulfillment in helping others. Like, what What is different there than doing something for yourself, like at a, at a brain level, at a chemical yeah, that's level? That's a great what? question. Yeah, Guthrie, do you want to, what, what, what would you say about that? I only have guesses about the brain physiology. Um, it's, it's, it's really only a guess. You know, uh, we have brain pathways that are specific for other people. We have a lot of brain pathways that are specific for other people. So for example, when we see a face, we instantly sort of see that way faster than we see everything else. There are special parts of the brain that we like to talk about called the fusiform facial area that is like just for recognizing, you know, the two eyes, the nose and the mouth. Um, we are, we have special parts of the brain just for recognizing uh, emotion on a face. Like there are, there's a lot of um, very uh, social behaviors that are, that are going on in the brain. So anytime you can take, um, you can tap into those. And I, I alluded earlier that they're probably the most powerful and they really are. I mean, to uh, feel like you are part of a tribe or a group will dictate so much more of what you do than if you, I don't know, get paid money to do it. it it's, it's so much stronger and so much deeper. So being able to tap into that uh, aspect of your brain, I think allows you to unlock um, deeper uh, connections and emotions than if you're just doing it yourself. That is that is my guess. Exactly what the brain physiology is there, I don't know. You could say something about the power of stories, um, but but I but I think it, there's it's it's the social tapping into a social element is just a deeper, stronger connection. Yep. You're uh, and and to be really exact about brain chemicals, one of the things you're doing when you're doing that is you're releasing oxytocin. And oxytocin right. is a brain chemical that makes you feel loved and loving and connected. And that's going to probably feel good. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much, guys. Super insightful. Lots of data here. Lots of tools here. Uh, Hope to, to see you soon. I'll be like following you. You have a bunch of amazing workshops and, and training. Let us know when the in-person trainings happen. Uh, and yeah, thank you so much for your time. It was great to uh, speak with you yeah. again. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. everyone.